This episode contains adult themes and is not appropriate for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Oh, hello, the world. This is They Will Kill. We are a true crime podcast. I am Courtney Eck. And I'm Sadie Eck. And we're sisters, and we're here to talk to you about murder. Uh, today, we're going to switch it up a little bit. Uh, normally, we proofread each other's stories before ahead of time, but we decided it would be more fun and a slightly more authentic experience if we don't do that. So I actually don't know anything about uh, what Sadie's going to be presenting today. Except that the main character has three names. So this is the case of Amy Marie Applegate. <laughs> no. <laughs> Close, but no. <laughs> well, take it away, Sadie. Tell us all about Amy Marie Applegate. Today we're going to talk about the University of Alabama in Huntsville mass shooting caused by Amy Bishop Anderson. Oh, come on. It's basically the same thing. And actually, <laughs> when I scheduled this recording, I titled it Amy? Question <laughs> mark. So I did, <laughs> I did get that right. That's, you did. Thanks. So February 12th, 2010 was a routine day for the biology department at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Professors taught their classes, met with students, and as the workday was ending, 12 faculty members met in room 369 on the third floor of the Shelby Center for Science and Technology. Mm. Uh, it was a regularly scheduled faculty meeting. I'm already so nervous. I hate mass shootings. It's I know. my worst thing. After 30 to 40 minutes, as the meeting was coming to an end, a woman named Amy Bishop Anderson who is a Harvard graduate and biology professor at the university, pulled out a Ruger P95 handgun. Holy shit. Stood up and began shooting those closest to her. What? How have I never heard of her? Uh, I think it's a total case of having so many mass shootings in this Excellent country. Point. That's yeah. a great point. What would cause this upper middle class 44-year-old woman to snap and murder three of her colleagues, injuring three others? Oh my god. Now, Amy Bishop was born on April 24th, 1965, to her parents, Sam and Judy. Her brother, Seth, was born three years later in 1968. They grew up in a suburb south of Boston called Braintree. Amy was described as a bright and empathetic child. She had asthma and spent her childhood in and out of the emergency room. Her early attraction to science was because of this. She wanted to find a cure for asthma. Mm. She started playing the violin in the third grade, and Seth asked his parents if he could play too. He always looked up to Amy. She was known to have a competitive streak, but those who knew them as children insist that the Bishop kids were close. Quote, she doted on her little brother, said Kathleen Oldham, a close friend of Amy's. They both loved music, loved science. She seemed to enjoy having someone younger to collaborate with. Mm. Amy was a loner in school, and Seth was described as shy but friendly and easy to be around. Seth loved modeled trains and would spend hours constructing his train sets in the attic of their house. So cute. Mm -hmm. Once in middle school, Seth was surrounded in the cafeteria by classmates who taunted him for carrying his violin and suggested mockingly that he play it. Seth removed the instrument from its case, raised his bow, and began to play beautifully until the bullies were cowed into silence. I love that story. <laughs> oh, my uh, God. No. He called their bluff. A friend who observed the episode remembered. Uh, that makes you want to cry with happiness. That I, is know. I know. I know. So hope. good. Yeah. If there's, like, how do you instill that level of, like, courage and bravery and self-confidence? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I feel like your oldest would do that. Mm-hmm. He's totally going to fucking show them. <laughs> Knock wood. Hopefully, hopefully we can just avoid any kind of bullying. Yeah, but yeah. if it happens because kids are kids, he's going to, yeah, He'll just like above. start popping and locking or something amazing. <laughs> Taekwondo in the Aww. shit out of people. Yeah. <laughs> so one night in 1985, the family returned home to find that they had been ransacked and robbed. Some of their most cherished family heirlooms had been stolen. The next day, Sam, Amy, and Seth's dad went out and bought a 12-gauge shotgun to have for protection. Mm -hmm. 
He kept the gun in his closet unloaded with a box of shells on a nearby dresser. So jumping ahead a little more than a year later, on December 6, 1986, at around 2 p.m., the Braintree police received a frantic 911 call from Judy Bishop. Oh, no. Her daughter had shot her son, she said. Oh, my God. The police raced to the scene. Judy met them at the front door. Her clothing was spotted with blood. She directed them to the kitchen. Seth lay in a pool of blood. He was bleeding to death from a chest wound. Oh, no. Amy, who was 21 at the time, wasn't there. As paramedics tried to revive her son, Judy spoke to the police. Seth had just returned home from the grocery store, she said, and she was in the kitchen with him when Amy came downstairs carrying Sam's shotgun. Judy told the officers, quote, Amy said to me, I have a shell in the gun and I don't know how to unload it. I told Amy not to point the gun at anybody, but as she swung the weapon around to show it to her brother, Judy said, quote, the gun fired. Ugh. The kitchen was small, and Amy had been standing close to her brother, so the shot hit Seth point blank. Mm. When he collapsed, Judy told the police Amy fled. God. She had run out of the house and went to a nearby Ford dealership, where she encountered two employees. Pointing the gun at them, she demanded a car and a set of keys, but when they hesitated, she left. Wow. One of the men would later say she claimed she'd gotten into a fight with her husband, who was going to kill her. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Minutes later, workers at a local business spotted Amy. When a police officer appeared, they waved him toward the woman with the gun. The officer told her to drop the weapon, but she complied only when another officer surprised her from behind. That sounds very premeditated, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, I understand running if you do something awful like that, but her responses to everyone seem premeditated. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, if you accidentally shoot your brother, you're... You help him. You're going to panic. Yeah. Yeah. You help him or you panic or, yeah, you just, yeah. But you're not like, don't have a cover story for when you go outside and encounter people. Right. Yeah. Her shotgun was still loaded with two unspent shells and she had another live shell in her jacket pocket. Wow. Wow. So it definitely wasn't just like, I this bullet stuck. I don't know how to get it out of there. She was locked and loaded and like Mm -hmm. had back up. Reloaded. Yeah. (laughs) So Amy was brought to the police station where she was interviewed. She told authorities that that morning she had been alone in the house. Her father had left quickly after he and Amy got into an argument. They were both angry and Sam wanted to cool off. Amy stated that she loaded the shotgun because she had been worried about, quote, robbers coming to the house. Mm -hmm. Seth had once taught her how to load the weapon, but never taught her how to unload it. So she loaded several shells, but as she was trying to figure out how to remove them, she accidentally fired a shot, shattering a vanity mirror and blasting a hole in her bedroom wall. (laughs) She tried to cover up using a Band-Aid box and a book cover. (laughs) Listen, one time when I was like 14, my best friend and I were like, we're tired of being babies. We're grown up goth emo girls now. And I took a clown poster off my wall. And said, this has got to go. And <laughs> lit it on fire with a candle. <laughs> <laughs> Word to the wise, clown posters are highly flammable. It went up so fast, threw it in the hallway, tried to put out the fire with my coat and burnt like a, I don't know, three foot hole in the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> so, yep. uh these That's exactly happen. what I thought of. Yeah, it was exactly what I thought of when I read that. <laughs> These you happen. covered it up with a rug. I think it took our our mom a while to find it. <laughs> yeah, but unlike Amy, like once I knew that a f- poster was flammable, I didn't light any more posters on fire. She right. knew that the f- gun uh, was loaded. The gun was loaded. How easy it was for it to go off. So then right. you don't take it downstairs and aim it at your brother. No, right. So when she heard Seth come home, she went downstairs and asked him to help her unload it, at which point she turned and the shotgun went off. Mm. The officer questioning her asked if she had shot her brother on purpose, and she stated no. Mm-hmm. At 3.08 p.m., Seth Bishop was pronounced dead at the hospital. His aorta had been ruptured. His oh. liver was destroyed. Oh, buddy. No, he was 18 years old. Oh, God. Amy later said that she was horrified by her brother's death. She insisted that it had been an accident, but she said, nevertheless, she felt guilty. Yeah. I the hope. police, yeah. The police briefly looked into the shooting and quickly ruled it an accident. Wow. 
Yeah. I mean, I guess there's no way to prove that it was anything but an accident. Yeah. And we'll circle back around to great to Seth. So today, someone who had witnessed or been responsible for a violent death of a sibling would almost certainly receive therapy. Yes. But Amy received no counseling or psychiatric evaluation after Seth's death. Oh, no. Her father was not a big believer in psychiatry. Mm -hmm. And Amy said that she didn't want to confront what had happened. Quote, I was just very insular, sticking to the house and trying to get over things, she recalled. Mm -hmm. I felt terrible. I didn't want to explore a terrible feeling. What year was this again? Uh, 86. Yes. So very much not a time where people got sought help for their mental illness or trauma. Right. So the bishops chose not to move. So Amy continued to eat meals in the kitchen where her brother had died. Oh, God. And to walk past his bedroom, which they left intact. Oh, no, guys. Oh, my God. So Amy attempted to move on with her life. She continued her studies at Northeastern University. And she met Jim Anderson, a fellow college student. They met in a campus group devoted to Dungeons and Dragons and other role-playing games. Cute. Mm -hmm. And so very 80s. Mm Mm-hmm. The two began dating. In 1988, she graduated from Northeastern and enrolled in the PhD program in genetics at Harvard. Wow. Wow. Yeah. After dating a few years, Amy and Jim got married in 1989. Uh, It was a simple ceremony at the church where the bishops had held Seth's wake. Oh, my God. I know. Amy's dad had told his daughter that one way to recover from her loss was to create life herself. In 1991, she gave birth to Lily, who was followed by two more daughters, Thea and Phaedra. Those are really cute names. Mm -hmm. Friends describe Amy as a loving, if high-strung mother. She bought organic food, encouraged her children to play instruments, and fretted over whether they were adequately challenged in school. Mm -hmm. She was also known to be overly protective. Amy, who had a fear of the herpes virus, wouldn't let her mother-in-law near her grandchildren because she sometimes got cold sores. Oh, no, 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 no. Amy found the PhD program at Harvard much more difficult than she thought it would be. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, And I think what the reference to that is that she kind of flew through Northeastern and did really well. Right. And hadn't ever really been super challenged in school. Right. And so she thought she was at Harvard level and maybe wasn't. Yeah, because basically nobody is. Right. Yeah. Uh, Having young children during this time didn't help. Yeah. In my experience, having young children doesn't really help much of anything other than just raising young children. (laughs) (laughs) It doesn't help complete a sentence, let alone a doctoral thesis. Yes. (laughs) Like I could barely squeak together a true crime story. (laughs) Yeah. So in 1993, after revising her thesis multiple times, she graduated with her doctorate in genetics. Wow. Amy started working as a researcher at a lab at Children's Hospital Boston. She'd been there for only a few months, but quit her job abruptly. Her boss, uh, who was named Paul Rosenberg, said that despite Amy's credentials, he felt, quote, she could not meet the standards required for the work. Mm-hmm. One person told investigators that the episode had left Amy, quote, on the verge of a nervous breakdown. The quitting or the interaction with her boss? The quitting. Yeah, I think the whole thing. Right. So she just wasn't up to snuff and right. so she yeah. peaced out. Rosenberg said she just didn't seem stable. Mm-hmm. Less than a month after Amy quit, Rosenberg was in the kitchen opening the mail. He had received a package that had been left inside his front storm door. Mm -hmm. The white cardboard box was about a foot square and three inches deep. There were six 29-cent stamps on the box. They had not been canceled. Hmm. Rosenberg had just so happened to recently attend a seminar on letter bombs. Oh, my God. The Unabomber had struck twice that year. And this heavy package looked suspicious. So very gingerly, he cut the tape around the edge with a knife and peeked inside. Two pieces of pipe, each about six inches long, were fixed in place. Wow. Wires were visible. He carefully shut the box, alerted his wife, and they fled. Wow. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. What are the odds that you go to a seminar on letter bombs and then get a letter bomb and know what it is? Right. Well, and I want to know, like, 
he's not in the letter bomb field. Like, you right. know, he's not law enforcement. He's a he's a researcher. So yeah, like, I get, was it just that's what you did in eighty in the nineties when the Unabomber yeah. was going on? Yeah, I think probably anybody in the public sector probably had yeah. to go. Or the you know, hospital, anybody. yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Anybody who worked in a giant building, right. that could be targeted. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when the bomb squad arrived, they found that the contraption was designed to go off when the lid was pulled open. Rosenberg wow. hadn't done that, and it probably saved his life. Unbelievable. Mm-hmm. I'm just... <laughs> like chills through my whole body i I I get any package i'm like yay what could it be (laughs) today i got i wasn't expecting any packages and there was a package in the front door and because i just been researching this i like looked out the window and it it was really beat up looked like somebody had like stomped on it and my first thought was oh god i did i totally opened it gingerly it was like a craft set for the boys i'd ordered forever ago (laughs) or was it (laughs) so uh, investigators looked into Amy and Jim as suspects. One witness told investigators that the couple both had it in for Rosenberg. Mm. Jim had said he, quote, wanted to get back at Rosenberg for his treatment of Amy. Uh, and according to case records from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, he said, quote, to shoot him, bomb him, stab him, or strangle him. Oh, my God. Yeah. Who did he say that to? To a couple that, oh, wow. that they were friends with. <laughs> I mean, well, you know, we all make hyperbolic statements to our friends after a couple drinks, but <laughs> I yeah. really hate that guy. I would punch him, kill him, stab <laughs> him, murder him, bomb him, <laughs> drown him. <laughs> Ooh, so specific. Uh, yeah. So Amy and Jim were questioned in the attempted bombing of Rosenberg, but no one was ever charged. Wow. Yep. Several people who knew them during these years suggested that when Amy felt injured or humiliated by some professional slight, mm. Jim tended not to soothe his wife's outrage, but to fan it. Oh, bleh. worst case scenario. Mm-hmm. One close friend of the couple said, quote, Amy was a narcissist. She had a deep desire to be reaffirmed. And that was the way that Jim held power over her. Nothing worse, man. Mm-hmm. I thought it would, that was an interesting that he would hold power over her by giving her that, like to feed her narcissism is a yeah. very interesting idea to me that I hadn't really thought of before. You're absolutely um, right. It's yeah. like usually a narcissist targets like an empath and mm-hmm. lords power over them. But if you're like a super narcissist and then you target yeah. a, a different kind of narcissist. Right, but they're kind of feeding to, mm-hmm. like feeding them each other. Well, it's kind of like the Diane Whipple case, like the... Mm-hmm. That big time fucking couple. That's yes. a good case of it yeah. where mm-hmm. separate, they're dangerous together. They're like catastrophic. Yeah. Yep. By 1996, Amy was working as a researcher at Harvard Teaching Hospital. She was also doing work at the Harvard School of Public Health. Mm-hmm. But eventually it began to dawn on her that she was not going to rise through the university's ranks. Mm-hmm. She had taken multiple maternity leaves. She also had to deal with her severe allergies, which required her to take steroids that sometimes made her zone out and lose track of reality. Oh, yeah. Not according a good, to Amy. Not a good combo yeah. as a doctor or researcher. Right. In the most prestigious <laughs> research facility in the mm-hmm. nation. Yeah. yeah. Amy was starting to wonder whether it might be a good idea to take her Harvard credentials where she'd be a bigger fish in a smaller pond. Mm -hmm. Maybe then, she confided to friends, she'd get the recognition she felt she deserved. Smart. In 2001, Amy had a baby boy. She named him Seth. Few of her friends were aware of the significance of the name. Quote, I knew her when she was pregnant, her friend recalled. Imagine having a whole conversation about baby names with someone who is sidestepping the fact that she was going to name her baby after her brother who she killed. Yeah. Yeah. In a strange twist of fate, Amy's son was born on what would have been her brother's 33rd birthday. No. Mm -hmm. Man, this case... (laughs) This should be called the wildly coincidental... (laughs) <laughs> goings on of Amy Marie Applegate because <laughs> uh, unbelievable I know. Uh, Amy had written poetry in college and later took up fiction Wow, uh, writing was actually a big passion of hers but her parents really wanted her to do something more academic mm-hmm. um, so Amy eventually produced three novels they wow. were dark 
Yeah, they were dark thrillers in the Michael Crichton vein. Are they, they for purchase? Can you get them? No, I was, no, I was just getting ready to say it, but they were never published. Damn it. I know. I mean, kind of not. <laughs> no, yeah, remember. Like morbid curiosity, <laughs> damn it. But I just, re- yeah, it's like buying the artwork, John Wayne Gacy's artwork. Like, Yeah, the the two main articles that I got a lot of this information from, there was one, uh, the wired.com, which I'll I'll actually talk about later. Mm-hmm. And they go in really deep detail, like passages of her books and how it corresponds with her actual life. And it was, it's a really interesting read. Mm-hmm. So you can definitely find, you know, pa- passages, but I don't know that the whole books are out there. I, I didn't honestly look. So are they any good? Like the writing? Um, not, not terrible. Yeah. I don't know. I didn't read the whole thing, so I don't know. But right. The, I, it's not like, like weird and fantastical and like, no you know how Mm -hmm. uh when people with personality disorders write sometimes (laughs) can get real flowery and sexy in a nerdy way (laughs) i mean it could very well be that i didn't get enough of it Uh, well i'll I'll investigate and report back okay (laughs) like amy the book's protagonists are of greek extraction they dream of illustrious careers in science Mm. and are haunted by the death of a child they once knew Mm-hmm. For several of Amy's characters, procreation offers a symbolic redemption. One of her protagonists is seized by a fear that her baby might grow up to resemble a boy named Luke, who died. Mm-hmm. Amy writes, quote, She wondered whether she could survive her boy's childhood, if she could, without crying, watch her child that looked like Luke run and play. Mm-hmm. So in her writing group, Amy said what she thought whenever it occurred to her, and then was surprised when people didn't take it well. Mm-hmm. Quote, she's kind of clueless socially, one of the regular members of the group said. And they continued, she would read someone's story and say, second paragraph, doesn't help, kill it. Or, I don't like this character, kill it. It wasn't really tactful. <laughs> that's very, like, Harvardy, though, I imagine. Mm-hmm. You know, that's very academic. Like, yeah. I but not, to... not at your, like, local yeah. <laughs> writing group at the library. <laughs> you can't handle my criticism. How are you ever going to be a serious writer? I'm a housewife. I just need a break. Right. <laughs> it's like writing about birds or whatever. So at one meeting not long after she joined the group, Amy arrived with one of her hefty manuscripts. Mm-hmm. Usually people brought passages or maybe chapters to share. Quote, she said, I'm sorry to spring it on you like this, but I wanted everyone to look at it before I gave it to my agent. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yes, Amy. Yes. Mm-hmm. This was more than the group leader could bear. Quote, he goes, agent? I don't think you're ready for an agent. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no. A taste of her own medicine. In another of her books, the protagonist, Beth, is a gun-running Harvard researcher who's testing an anti-cancer drug that has an unfortunate side effect. It makes mother rats eat their own young. (laughs) (laughs) I'm kind of into it, Mm -hmm. honestly. Beth is the most fully drawn of all of Amy's characters. Depressed about her life and career, she uses sarcasm to cope, tapping a vein of black humor as in this exchange about an upcoming potluck hosted by the head of her lab. So this is a quote from the book. Beth's colleague, quote, I think I'm bringing dumplings tomorrow to Dick's. What are you bringing? Beth. A gun, death, and destruction. Hell on earth. (laughs) Horror. (laughs) extremely into that (laughs) there's a book sorry there's a lot of detours you're reminding me of a lot of things i have a lot in common with amy apparently but um (laughs) found magazine from like the early 2000s Mm -hmm. which is so good there was a grocery list that was like these are just objects that people would find and they'd send them to this guy and he would publish them in a magazine so it's just like notes people find on the street and there was a grocery list that somebody found and it said like mayonnaise Lettuce, bread, sex, and understanding. <laughs> That's right. A gun, death, and destruction, hell on earth, horror. <laughs> Devil mm-hmm. digs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so one Saturday morning in 2002, Amy, Jim, and the children went for breakfast at a crowded IHOP. When they requested a booster seat for Seth, the waitress told them that the last one had just been given to another person. Quote, but we were here first, Amy yelled. She approached the woman who was given the last booster seat. She was sitting down to breakfast with her own kids and launched into a crazy rant. 
quote, I am Dr. Amy Bishop, she shrieked repeatedly. Wow. The manager asked Amy to leave the restaurant, and she complied, but first she walked back to the woman with the booster seat and punched her in the head. <laughs> <laughs> The image of that is <laughs> well, really this poor woman. Like I... <laughs> just, she just got a booster seat for a kid. Like, I got a s- an fully IHOP. assaulted. Oh yeah. no! With their French fries <laughs> with salt. Doctor Amy, Amy Bishop. Bishop. Yeah. So Amy was arrested. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. And she later told a friend that she'd beat the rap by wearing her white lab coat to court. Crumping the woman by looking more professional. <laughs> That's smart. Uh, this, I, I listen, Amy. She got a few things right. <laughs> she got a lot of things really wrong. Right. But yeah, but this never became necessary because the charges against her were dropped and never appeared on her permanent record. Mm-hmm. So she was just slipping out of really nasty shit left it's and right. Unbelievable. So at the time, Amy was still doing postdoctoral research. It was clear to those who knew her well that she was under a great deal of pressure to succeed in a demanding profession that can be inhospitable to women. Yep. While also caring for four young children. Yeah, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. Several people who know the family noted that Amy was the sole breadwinner. Jim never obtained an advanced degree and worked only sporadically. What was his profession? Not that it matters, but... I don't think he really had. Right, just whatever. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He would often work uh, laboratory jobs that he secured through Amy's assistance. Right. So in 2003, Amy accepted a tenure track job at the University of Alabama, Huntsville. The move seemed to promise some financial stability. Mm-hmm. She and Jim began to collaborate on the invention of an automated cell incubator. Whoa. Yeah. David Williams, who is a president of the university, predicted to a local paper that the device would, quote, change the way biological and medical research is conducted. Do you have any idea what that device would do? No, don't. Other than something to cells, incubate cells. Yeah, it automatically does that. (laughs) (laughs) But because Amy was pursuing patents rather than writing papers, her publication record was scant. And she appears not to have heeded repeated warnings that failing to publish more could jeopardize her prospects of tenure. Mm -hmm. She did know better in the classroom, where she would occasionally tell her students that they were not as bright as their peers at Harvard. Oh, no. Yeah. She abruptly dismissed several graduate students from her lab, and others requested to be transferred. Yeah. Amy had always been anchored to some extent by her friends and family in Massachusetts, but as her career began to drift in Huntsville, she grew increasingly isolated and stopped returning their phone calls and emails. Mm -hmm. She was prone to erratic and bizarre behavior, but things were escalating. By 2008, according to Amy's father-in-law, the family's house was a, quote, disaster. Mm. Unopened mail and clutter was everywhere. While visiting for a few days, he says he tried to clean up and set things right, but he cut the visit short after a chilling altercation with Amy. Hmm. They were talking in the kitchen, quote, and suddenly I said something that set her off, and she was just totally changed. I have never seen anyone before or after whose face, whose body language changed so 100%. I saw a major difference in her eyes. The color of her skin even changed. It was menacing. I've seen that once in my life, and it was the scariest thing I've ever seen. Yeah, right? In 2009, she published an article in the International Woman of General Medicine and listed four co-authors, Jim, Lily, Thea, and Phaedra. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Quote, we were going to do a lot of work side by side and bring the kids in on it, Jim later explained to Wired, like the Curies did. (laughs) (laughs) All right, guys. Mm -hmm. That spring, Amy's tenure was denied. At least one member of her committee expressed a concern that she was, quote, crazy, telling the Chronicle of Higher Education that he had first worried about her mental health, quote, five minutes after I met her. Wow. Amy filed a series of appeals, eventually hiring a lawyer. Mm, wow. I don't know how that, I know it's not good when you, if you're denied tenure, but do you know how long you have to reapply? Or like what the I get the impression is? that um, that it's pretty much done. You have to start all over again. Right. You That's can appeal it. Right. Yeah. 
but it it's really intense and devastating when yeah. you when you're on a tenure track and you don't get it and you don't make it and then mm-hmm. you try to go someplace else and they're I know the academic world is mm-hmm. very tight knit so they're already going to mm-hmm. automatically know if it's not on your transcripts that you didn't mm-hmm. yeah okay yeah. So, yeah. it's so it's awful a whole thing to have yeah. happen yeah and that's again if, if you go and read any of the articles about this they talk about that more in in depth is just how rigorous it is and mm-hmm. how devastating it is for professors to not get tenure yep well, that's the only way you can make a living as a professor is to be tenured because otherwise you make, I mean, now you make like, I don't know, something insane, like $300 a month or something. <laughs> like it's right. a shockingly low number. Yeah. Yeah. So since childhood, Amy had suffered from severe allergies, which could manifest as hives or eczema. Mm-hmm. In the months before the shootings in Alabama, she was under tremendous stress. And according to Amy, she began to hallucinate. Mm. Shortly after Seth's death, she said she had started to, quote, hear voices. And since then, they had continued off and on, coinciding occasionally with allergy attacks. Yep. When asked about the voices, she said, quote, sometimes they're scary and sometimes they're not, but wouldn't elaborate past that. Oh, no. Yeah. One day soon after her tenure was denied, Amy drove to the university and parked in front of the administration building. Sitting in her car, she called the office of the president and asked if she could meet with him to discuss her case. Mm. She was told that the president would not meet with her and that she should not even enter the building. Wow. Yeah. According to an affidavit written by Amy in prison, she then saw Williams and the provost hurriedly leave the building, escorted by the police. Holy shit. I know. Amy telephoned one of her colleagues, quote, they act like I'm going to walk in and shoot somebody, she said. And then she sprouted an idea. Mm-hmm. When I also, I mean, it just as an example of how uncomfortable she made people feel. Absolutely. You know, I think that they really were afraid of her already and didn't have anything to base it off of. But if, I, and maybe that's just the way it is. If you were denied tenure, it's <laughs> the president's like, nope, I can't talk to you. And they got to run. I don't know. But I, uh, I have a feeling that's not the case. Right. But yeah, mm-hmm. I'm also interested. I mean, I brought it up couple episodes ago about correlation between allergies and anxiety Mm -hmm. and it's just a quick side note but you know that inflammation has got to wreak Mm -hmm. all sorts of havoc on your body and Mm -hmm. your mental health and this comment goes nowhere because I don't have any like additional information but it is something that I'd be really interested in finding out more about Mm -hmm. clearly she's got schizophrenia or Mm -hmm. bipolar or some kind of serious problem if her allergies are making it worse i I just think that's really interesting and Mm -hmm. wonder how often that comes into play something Mm -hmm. as simple as like hay fever or something right you know yeah yep so a week before the killings amy and jim went to a firing range on the edge of town for target practice they brought along a nine millimeter handgun that a friend gave to jim nearly a decade before amy told him target practice would be fun she said it's a sport Jim replied, you can do this? He was thinking of her brother, Seth. Mm-hmm. He remembers her saying, quote, I'll just try it. Uh-oh. Yeah, if your wife just got denied tenure and has a history of, like, aggression and mental illness, you might want to just go to a spa retreat or something and mm-hmm. uh, avoid the shooting range for right. a couple of years. Yeah. So on February 12th, 2010, Amy was attending a faculty meeting at the University of Alabama Huntsville. Hmm. What I'm going to quote next is directly from an article in Wired Magazine titled, What Made This University Researcher Snap? Quote, when she heard the first deafening boom, Deborah Moriarty, a biochemist, thought the walls were caving in. Quote, what's falling? She wondered as she looked up from the notes she'd been taking. Mm. She could hardly make sense of what she saw. Amy was firing a pistol at her fellow scientists. Mm Mm-mm. For the better part of an hour, Amy had been sitting at the end of a long conference table, listening to a dozen people discuss the biology department's budget and other matters. Now, standing near the room's only door, she was transformed. Aiming at one colleague's head after another, she pulled the trigger again and again. Oh, God. So Gopi Padilla, the department chair who specialized in molecular biology of plants, was already down and bleeding. So was Stephanie Monticello, the staff assistant who had attended the 3 p.m. meeting to keep the minutes. Those two had been on Amy's right. Now she turned left and shot the person nearest to her, Adrielle Johnson, an expert in gastrointestinal physiology. Next to Johnson was plant scientist Maria Raglan Davis. Amy shot her too. Mm. 
than the department's newest faculty member, molecular biologist Luis Cruz Vera, was wounded in the chest by a ricocheting bullet or bone fragment. As Joseph Leahy, whose research focused on biodegradation of hydrocarbons, ducked for cover, a bullet tore through the top of his head, severing his right optic nerve. Ugh, God. The article continues. Moriarty had dived under the table. Now kneeling on the rug, she grabbed hold of Amy's blue jeaned leg. Amy, don't do this, she pleaded. Think about my grandson. Think about your daughter. Amy's wow. eldest daughter, Lily, was a student at the university. She studied biology with some of the people that were trapped in the room. Mm-hmm. Quote, please snap out of this, she thought. This has to stop. As if in response, Amy pointed the gun at Moriarty and pulled the trigger. Click. Mm. It didn't fire. Oh, my God. Still on her hands and knees, she half rolled, half crawled toward the door. Amy right behind her. Amy's eyes seemed cold and, quote, very, very evil looking. Now they were in the hall. Amy took aim at Moriarty again and again squeezed the trigger. Click. Mm. The gun still wouldn't fire. Oh my god. Quote, somebody help us. She screamed and threw herself back into the room, slamming the door. In the few seconds she was in motion, she could hear Amy trying but failing to get her weapon to work. Click, click, click. Jesus. With six people wounded, there was blood everywhere. On the table and chairs, on the white drywall. Someone used a coffee table to barricade the door. Someone else found a cell phone and dialed 911. Moriarty and the five others who were unhurt tried to aid their ravaged colleagues, Mm. but all they had to staunch the bleeding were napkins and their own clothes. Oh, God. Padilla, the affable 52-year-old department chair, who had been one of Amy's biggest supporters, was on the floor. He would soon die from his wounds. Mm -hmm. So, too, would Associate Professor Johnson also 52, and Davis, who was 50 years old. Mm -mm. Three of the six injured would survive. Cruz Vera would be hospitalized briefly, but the other two wouldn't be so lucky. A bullet had entered Monticello's right cheek and exited through her left temple. Her sinuses were shattered. The teeth on the right side of her mouth were knocked out. The shot left tooth fragments in her airway. She would be blind in her left eye. Oh, God. Leahy had numerous fractured facial bones that would require wiring his jaw shut, implanting a feeding peg into his stomach, and affixing a titanium plate to his forehead. Good God. Eventually, he would develop an antibiotic-resistant staph infection. Oh, no. (laughs) But that would come later. Right now, they huddled in the windowless, fluorescently lit conference room. It was just 17 by 21 feet. It was their safe house and also their prison. They had no idea whether Amy was coming back. Mm -hmm. So once she realized the gun had jammed, Amy decided to leave. On her way down from the third floor, she had ducked into a restroom to stuff her gun and blood-spattered black and red plaid jacket into the trash can. She walked into a lab and asked a student if she could borrow his cell phone. She then called Jim, as she often did after work, and told him to pick her up. I'm done, she said. Wow. Yeah. At 4.10 p.m., the ambulances rushed to the scene. A Madison County Sheriff's deputy approached Amy and took hold of her. She looked dazed as her hands were cuffed and she was put into a squad car. Later, during an interrogation that went on for more than two hours, Amy would insist, quote, I wasn't there and, quote, it wasn't me. Mm-hmm. This was crazy. Twelve people who knew Amy, nine witnesses who were still alive and knew Amy well, easily identified her as a shooter. Mm-hmm. She became the first academic in U.S. history to be accused of gunning down fellow professors. Yeah. That's why I'm so surprised I didn't hear about this before. Mm -hmm. In the aftermath of the shooting, the big question was why. Many theories came up. She must be mentally ill. Mm -hmm. Or that being denied tenure caused her to do it. Combination of both. Right. That's what I think. Yeah. The tenure idea is the grueling year-long process of trying to win a permanent professorship and the despair that accompanied being denied tenure by her peers made Amy snap. Mm -hmm. This explanation got a lot of traction right after the vicious lanes. Is the tenure process itself vicious? Some, like Catherine Von Warmer, a blogger for Psychology Today who has herself been denied tenure, says it is, Mm -hmm. quote, I would describe the denial of tenure as an end to one's career, to one's livelihood. Yeah. That's what she wrote after the killings. She said being denied tenure, in effect, fired by your peers is the ultimate rejection. 
Yeah, absolutely. Especially if you've worked so hard to get that level of degree too. I mean, it's Mm -hmm. like an enormous amount of time and money and energy and brain power spent. And then to have it just like cut short seems really insane. Mm -hmm. Not as a justification for mass murder, of course, remotely, but you know, in the broader sense of, (laughs) yeah, there might be a better way to average academic. Yeah. Yeah, Mm -hmm. absolutely. Although tenure decisions are not public, university officials say that Amy had indicated that she'd found out which colleagues had voted for or against her. Oh, no. Uh, Yet she shot some of the very people who had supported her. In the wake of the massacre, plenty of scrutiny was aimed at the Braintree Police Department, whose investigation of the 1986 shooting of Seth many felt was incomplete and swept under the rug because of the connections that Amy's parents had with local law enforcement. Uh That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Had Amy been charged, tried, and convicted of that murder, three UAH professors could still be alive. Yep. According to Brenda Wade, who is a clinical psychologist who's followed the case closely, she said that Amy's feelings of insecurity, her fear of being slighted, her mood swings, her lack of impulse control, are symptoms of borderline personality disorder. People with this condition often toggle between two extremes, mm-hmm. experiencing love-hate relationships idealizing someone one minute and then being furious with them the next. Mm -hmm. But they aren't typically violent. Quote, she's got something else going on, a remarkable lack of remorse, Wade says. Mm -hmm. That's a huge feature, and it makes me wonder whether she also has what we used to call sociopathic or psychopathic behavior. Yep. Psychopaths have no remorse. Uh, In some way, they are disconnected from real life and real relationships. Yep. So on June 16th, 2010, back in Massachusetts, the Norfolk District Attorney, William Keating, held a press conference where he made an announcement. Nearly 24 years after Seth Bishop's death, a grand jury had indicted his sister Amy on a charge of first-degree murder. Wow. Yeah. Keating didn't mince words, quote, jobs weren't done, responsibilities weren't met, justice was not served. He wanted to explain that law enforcement officers in Massachusetts had bailed in 1986. Police never told the district attorney's office that after Amy shot her brother, she tried to commandeer a getaway car at gunpoint and that she refused to drop her gun until the officers repeatedly ordered her to do so. Mm -hmm. Uh, William Delahunt, who was the district attorney in Norfolk at the time, released a statement. He said they would have prosecuted Amy back then, but the Braintree police did not provide them with necessary reports and photos of the crime scene. Mm-hmm. Big no-no. Mm-hmm. One photo of Amy's bedroom showed a National Enquirer article on the floor. It was about the killing of the parents of actor Patrick Duffy, mm. who played Bobby Ewing on the television show of Dallas, and also involved the use of a shotgun and commandeering of a vehicle from a car dealership. Hmm. So two days after being indicted in Massachusetts, Amy slashed her wrists with a razor blade. Whoa. She survived after a guard found her bleeding in her cell. Quote, I tried to kill myself because I was hallucinatory delusional and could not take UAH and being indicted for my brother's accident, she said in a letter to a friend. Yep. Amy originally pled not guilty to the murders at UAH. Her trial was scheduled for September 24th, 2012. But two weeks before that date, her attorney approached the prosecution about the possibility of a deal. Amy was willing to plead guilty to capital murder in exchange for a commitment by prosecutors <laughs> that they would not seek the death penalty. Mm-hmm. Prosecutors agreed, and Amy was quickly sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Good. I mean, duh, but good. Yeah. A few days after Amy's guilty plea, the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office released a statement announcing that it would not seek her extradition because Massachusetts does not have the death penalty. Uh, Given that Amy is serving life without parole in Alabama, the statement explains the penalty we would seek is already in place. Perfect. Yeah, Mm -hmm. there's no need to waste hundreds of thousands of dollars to bring her home and give her the exact same sentencing. Yeah, and Amy's parents were really adamant that they believed it was an accident. They did Mm -hmm. not want her to be charged. They press charges, yeah. Yeah, they didn't want her to be uh, tried for his murder either. Mm Mm-hmm. So then the case took an unexpected turn. Amy let it be known that she wanted to be tried for Seth's death. Whoa. Yeah. She had always insisted that the shooting was an accident, and she appeared to resent the implication of the withdrawn indictment. Whoa. Yeah. Quote, she wants to use a trial to help demonstrate that she's innocent, her attorney explained. 
I want the truth to come out, Amy said. I want that for me, for my parents, for closure. Man. Despite that, Amy will not be tried for the murder of her brother, Seth. Not it's good. Not up to her. Good. Uh, she will, however, spend the rest of her life in prison for the murders of Gopi Padilla, Maria Raglan Davis, and Adriel Johnson Sr. Good riddance. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to end the story by telling you who these victims were. Great. So Gopi Padilla was described by colleagues as always willing to offer support, encouragement, and thoughtful ideas. He made many scientific contributions in his field of engineering tree species for increased biomass, disease resistance, and stress tolerance. Mm. The word humble was used to describe him often. Uh, Casual acquaintances probably never knew that he had published three books. He held four patents and was considered a global leader in his field. Holy shit. That is awesome. I mean... What a mark to leave. I'm going to say that probably the next for two more times to two yes. more people, but what an amazing life to have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Gopi was known as a gentleman. He had great intellect, a wonderful smile and infectious laughter. He once told one of the professors he was in charge of, quote, I don't ever want to be your boss. I want to be your colleague and your friend. Buddy. I know. <laughs> oh. Another colleague said, quote, I think he was everyone's idea of a favorite professor. Mm-hmm. He was charming, delightful, energetic. He was so into his students. Nothing better than a favorite professor, I truly, know. truly, or teacher, truly. Right. Nearly 1,000 people packed his funeral to offer support to his widow, Vani, and their two daughters. <laughs> Maria Raglan Davis was an associate professor of biology. Her background was in chemical engineering and biochemistry. She specialized in plant pathology and biotechnology applications. Amazing. She worked on genetically modifying strawberries to be drought resistant. Wow. She hoped to create plants that would benefit developing countries. Mm Mm-hmm. One of her passions was encouraging students. She was committed to involving young people in science, especially minority students and those from disadvantaged backgrounds. One of her colleagues believed that Maria motivated hundreds of students to go into science during her lifetime. Mm -hmm. She was married to Sammy Lee Davis, Sr., and they had three children together, Sammy Jr., Latasha, and Melissa. Her faith was important to her, and she was a member of the Plymouth United Church of Christ in Detroit. And then we have Adriel Johnson Sr. He was a Boy Scout growing up, and after becoming an Eagle Scout, he was a lifelong member of the National Eagle Scout Association. Awesome. His faith was central to his life, and he was an active member of the Union Chapel Missionary Baptist Church. Mm Mm-hmm. He was described as having a quiet strength, confidence, and a commanding presence. He was a leader to his family, the university, and the community at large. He was an assistant professor at UAH. He passionately instructed, mentored, and encouraged numerous students. Mm -hmm. He taught many different science courses, which included biology, introduction to health professions, anatomy and physiology, cell biology, nutritional physiology, (laughs) animal physiology, and medical terminology. That's incredible. Adriel was the recipient of numerous awards in recognition of his community, scholarship, and academic achievements. Mm -hmm. And it was really, when I found the list, it was like huge. It was this huge, huge paragraph of just one award after another. Imagine, no. (sighs) He was an assistant scout master and coached baseball for the local youth league. He enjoyed going fishing with his family, cooking on the grill, and having fellowship with his friends and neighbors. Of all the lives he touched, his wife, Dr. Jacqueline Johnson, and his two sons, A.D. Jr. and Jerry L. will no doubt miss him the most. No doubt. God. And there you have it, folks. Oh, God. Well, and like right now when we're in a time where the whole world will be saved by scientists. Right. <laughs> you yes. know, like we're all just hanging out in our houses waiting for scientists to get it right, <laughs> which they are rapidly. Mm-hmm. And like, it's ugh. so important. The work it's they do is so important. So important. And... You know, I can't stop consuming news about the work that they're doing because 
it's so important (laughs) you know everything hinges on it right now but yeah it's interesting it's miraculous it's fucking complicated Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's like i just can't get enough and so that hits extra close to home right now that those poor people were taken and that their contributions were robbed we were robbed of their contributions Mm -hmm. but also i don't know when you think about the mark that you're going to make on this world like i said before how incredible to have been here and done that much in your short life like that's um it's just amazing i know i I know i think about that constantly (laughs) and I know. I'm content just being like a nice guy. <laughs> right. It would be awesome to be like, and she had 150 patents. <laughs> she had 45 pages of awards. You know, like, God, unbelievable. Just mm-hmm. good for them. Yeah. How sad. I'm so that sorry is for their families. I know that somebody like Amy Bishop Anderson would come in and destroy their lives. You know. Absolutely. Just yeah. so randomly. And, I'm always so interested in, you know, the big thing that drives me to continue to listen to true crime is like figuring things out. I have this like endless curiosity. I always want to know how the story ends and begins, you know, Mm -hmm. like I just want to know everything about it. And she is a fascinating case. Mm -hmm. I mean, she sounds like a deeply complicated person and had a deeply complicated pathology of Mm -hmm. some kind or many kinds, you know, it's like definitely some kind of mental illness and or personality disorder exacerbated by allergies, you know, terrible mm-hmm. allergies and the stress of the most rigorous career that somebody can take basically other than like maybe politics. It's like being a doctor, I, I can't think of anything harder or more stressful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, I could unpack that and take it apart and look at it forever and ever and ever. So good, good choice. I'm nice. super into it. <laughs> super yeah, post, into it. Obviously, I'll... I'll post pictures and she had a, a look about her that would make yeah. you want to call the police and escort you out of the building if she I had have chills leave. just thinking about it like I can yeah you know you know you did a really good job of describing her you know that person just very unhinged mm-hmm. and could snap at any moment and yeah. like makes the hairs on your neck stand up yeah, yeah I gotta give credit to the New Yorker and the Wired articles I felt like I hit the jackpot and being able to retell other people's really hard work. Yeah, man. Um, so can't doesn't get any better. Those. Yeah, I'll post them in our show notes and yeah. Good so, one. Good thanks. one. I mean tragic and fuck that, but right. so what a crazy. good one. Yeah, so crazy. I really can't believe I've never heard of Amy Marie Applegate before. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot. Mm-hmm. Good one. Wow, man. Yeah. No. Well, I'm probably going to try to find anything I can on her. I, Laura and I did go back and watch <laughs> last night. Yesterday, I listened, re-listened to our episode two of the Jeffrey Lundgren case. And at seven o'clock last night, my wife and I watched the uh, Deadly Colts episode. Of Jeffrey <laughs> Lundgren. <laughs> I'm serious, man. Once I lock in, it's like a pit bull style. I just can't <laughs> get enough. I know. I don't, that, that won't be happening in our household right now. My uh, husband, Ryan, is not a typical <laughs> true crime fan. And I had him listen to the those part one and two because I thought it was pretty good. Yeah. Poor <laughs> Ryan. It, pretty, it ruined his day. Like, I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> Poor guy. So we won't be watching any documentaries covering the one that is cult. <laughs> that is fair. I don't blame him. He's yeah. a sensitive guy. He's yeah. a good person, unlike us. <laughs> right. Well, and I forget. Right. Exactly. I forget that not everybody has this stupid fascination for true crime like i do i know i know i've i'm like coming out as a true crime aficionado to my friends and like i just didn't know this about you you don't really (laughs) strike me i'm like yeah i love horror love Mm -hmm. horror and murder and people are like interesting Mm -hmm. yeah i'm having the same like people who knew me especially as a doula like oh this is a strange (laughs) turn of events (laughs) surprise yep uh Uh, good stuff um really good stuff yeah we got Uh, a couple businesses a couple businesses yeah do you want to talk about our patreon i mean there's not much to talk about but we are setting up a patreon there you go should be up soon if you have any interest in uh supporting us in that way we'll do extra episodes at some point yep um we'll do little giveaways yep little freebies Yep, we've got an order out for some cool 
merch and mm-hmm. and bonuses for becoming a subscriber. We'll definitely give shout outs. That's one of our favorite things to do. And speaking of which, I want to give a shout out. Um, I mentioned last week that I'll be mailing masks to people who need them. And I have been and it's really fun. And I've gotten a great response from it. Um, and I just want to thank Laura Hudson, who is a adorable listener who is sending uh, me a pile of vintage fabric right awesome. now. So cute. She sent me a picture of it at the post office. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to keep it going. I'll keep posting. I know our dear friends in New York are all mandated to wear masks when they leave the house, so they're all going to need them. So mm-hmm. if you're listening or if you're following us on social media and you need a mask, send me your address and I'll send you a mask. Yep. Mm-hmm. They're free. They're free. It's free. <laughs> it's my community service to keep us safe and also save the USPS because you know I think we're going to be able to save it. But yeah. the way we save it is by buying stamps, and it just, just so happens that these masks fit into kind of a standard size envelope. So. I'm mailing them the old-fashioned way with stamps. Um, And one last thing I was thinking about, we, what do we call you guys? Like, what do we call our listeners? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. (laughs) (laughs) My answer is just too snarky and not true, so I'm not going to say it out loud. Say it. (laughs) Idiots. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God, that makes my heart hurt. I know. (laughs) No. No. Um... I mean, the first thing that I think of, obviously, is killers. You could be our killers, but it might be a little too aggressive. I'm thinking of it like 1950, like, hey, killer. killer. Yeah, mm-hmm. like, like hey, chief. Hey, killer. But I don't know if that translates out of context. Um, but, I, yeah, I want to I want, I want, want to think of that. I'll probably post about it on social media and see what you guys, if, you, if anybody uh, is more clever than I am with naming things, naming things is my least favorite thing. Mm-hmm. Um I know the fact that we even have a name for our podcast is pretty amazing. <laughs> it really, truly is amazing. It was the thing that, like, I stalled on the longest. Like, oh, God, what are we going to do? Uh, I don't, yeah, and then we came up with it. Thank God. Mm-hmm. And then it scared us both really badly. And so we're like, that's, <laughs> that's the one. Yep. Oh, speaking of which, I was sending out masks and, you know, in lieu of a uh, return address, like, I love you guys, but I'm not going to give you my home address. Um, I was just writing, they will kill smiley face on the back of the envelope. And then I realized it's a little sinister to send. (laughs) They will kill smiley face. (laughs) So I added podcasts. They will kill podcast smiley face. (laughs) Fast forward. Speaking of pipe bombs. I know. Seriously. Sadie and I end up in federal prison for sending threatening Uh... mail. (laughs) <laughs> the fbi shows up and... oh god <laughs> i was just trying to send him some masks uh yeah anything else i don't think so don't either. good no. job great Thank work you. good Thanks job so everybody much. uh you can find us on instagram at they will kill facebook and twitter at they will kill yep uh, you can email us at they will kill podcast at gmail.com. Yep. What else? You can go to our website, which is oh, they will yeah. com. And people have been, they kept continuing. I don't know if you're hearing us say that we like your messages and mm-hmm. sending them, but mm-hmm. we got a big influx of messages this week. And you guys, I am a Leo. I will work for compliments, but <laughs> seriously, <laughs> oh, it makes me yeah. feel so good and it really I cannot tell you how much it motivates us to continue to do this so thank you so much for taking time out of your day to do that it is tremendously helpful and tremendously motivating and Absolutely. just means so much yeah we really are here for you guys Heck so yeah. much yep uh and if you want to take them and translate them into rates reviews and subscriptions that is also helpful mm-hmm. thank you if you are so inclined and remember, oh, well, what? Well, can't forget AJ. Thank oh. you, AJ Bergantz, for our music. Thank you so much. And remember, mm. I just really wanted to throw it back at you. I know, you didn't <laughs> want to do it. Ooh. And remember to high five a scientist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we need them. Yeah, of any variety any kind of scientist don't <laughs> yeah. high five the pseudoscientists no. <laughs> just the reg reg scientists that's right oh, i'm doing the best i can i know man <laughs> i'm there with you 
<laughs> we're on week 70,000 of quarantine and we're doing the best we can. We're doing the best we can. We're all doing the best we can. We're doing a good job. You guys yep. are doing a good job. It's working. Yep. In the areas that it is being done correctly or mostly correctly. So keep it the fuck yes, up. <laughs> Good job. All right. All right. High five you. a scientist. That's right. We love you. Don't practice pseudoscience. And goodbye. 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 goodbye.